Welcome, everyone. We're having a great conversation right before we went live. Um, session five, landlording, that's so easy. You forget you have an investment property. As always, I'm your host, Jonathan Vasquez. I did a long intro a couple of sessions ago, so I will not do that today. I have a very special guest today. Um, you know, as you saw, we we're having a great conversation. Didn't even realize we were live. Uh, Dana Dunford, CEO of Hemlane, named one of the top 20 women leaders and influencers in commercial real estate tech. We just spent, what, like 30 minutes having a great conversation about everything, including real estate. So we're going to talk more about that. And I'll give you some time to introduce yourself in a couple of minutes. But first, let's talk about the takeaways for today. Um, well, first of all, last time, um, two weeks ago, we had a great conversation on how to find properties remotely and how to invest outside of your local market. Today, we're going to get more into the property management aspect. Uh, and, and Dana has a lot of experience managing properties remotely in different places. So we'll, we'll continue that topic from a couple of weeks ago. So today, you can expect um, to learn how to find good tenants and how to avoid the bad ones how to price your property to keep your tenants happy and vacancy slow, and some ways to prevent maintenance issues for a stress-free lease. As always, disclaimer, the content on this presentation and any future broadcasting is for informational purposes only. Please consult a licensed mortgage or financial professional for your specific scenario. So with that, let's roll. Let me put the slides away. Dana, welcome. Thank you for Great. being here. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Yeah, no, super excited. Would you mind taking uh, maybe a minute or two to introduce yourself, let the audience know, um, you know, who you are, what you do, and what Hamlin is about? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dana Dunford. I've been in real estate, gosh, for over um, now. It's it's going on ten years um, in the industry. Uh, and I think very similar to Jonathan, we were talking about this earlier, um, you typically get into it from a family member or a friend. And um, for me, education was like very rough at the beginning, I kind of learned by doing, which may not be the best way to do it. I probably should have listened to a couple of these webinars back then. Uh, but back in uh, 2014, basically kind of frustrated a little bit with um, how property management technology was going and how it was built. Um, met my co-founder, who's also a real estate investor, and said, hey, let's do something really focused primarily on just property management and provide a solution for a mass market out there. Um, and so obviously going through that um, journey, um, not only own experience with investments, but also managing now over 18,000 rental properties, I've kind of seen it all. Um, and I think uh, obviously where you invest will really dictate a lot of things such as um, how um, how your property is going to perform, what the tenant landlord laws are and, and how to go about um, understanding, you know, um, how to create a lease, how to talk to your tenants, et cetera. Um, so I'm really excited to jump into it and then talk about uh, property management here with you, Jonathan. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that number again? How many properties have we managed on Himley currently? Over 18,000 rentals. 18,000. That's an amazing number. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, well, actually, before we even get into that, you were in tech for a while before you started Himley. Mm-hmm. What drove you to start building something out in the property management space versus something else? Yeah, so I, honestly, I could have built something in any sort of industry. I felt property management and real estate was about basically 10 to 20 years behind other industries in technology. Um, so I saw a massive opportunity there. And I could have gotten passionate around anything. It was really solving a big pain point and also changing the industry rather than layering technology on top of the existing industry. And I think that was really important for me was to say, I, we're not just going to go into this to say, oh, you know, here is software to make yourself more efficient. 
we're actually going to completely change the mindset so that more people would invest in real estate. And, um, you know, my background, uh, first, I'd, I'd worked at a company called Symantec in security software. When you do over 300 million of annualized payments, um, which is what Hemling does, you realize how important security is. Um, so that was good for my background. Um, but then I worked at Apple and at Apple, it, you always really were focused on the, the user experience. And providing something really seamless where essentially you didn't need an, a user manual. It told you what to do at the right time. You know, it made it incredibly easy to function your life as a consumer um, and the day to day and made it more pleasant to have these conversations, Jonathan, like you and I are having today, where we almost feel like we're in the same room. We can see each other and see each other's expressions. But, you know, we're across the country. You're in Florida and I'm in California. And so wanted to do the same thing with property management, um, knowing our investments were out of state, wanted to take that same, hey, how do you provide that feel of having a presence somewhere, even though you're not there, having an, a, a connection to someone, even if you may not be there, was super important. And then I went after Apple to Nest, Nest is home technology. And I thought it was fantastic that from my phone, I could see you know, everything going around the cameras outside my house. I could control my thermostat when I left the house and when I got back in. And that home technology part got me really fascinated about kind of next generation property management. And you know, if there's a leak, how could you detect that beforehand so the tenant wouldn't be responsible for that? You would have um, smart technology to do that. And so kind of blending that whole background from Symantec to Apple to Nest took that into the prop tech space into uh, what is Hemling today to create a better experience for property management. Awesome. That's amazing. I love the passion. I mean, you're talking about your career trajectory, right? But I can see the passion, how you brought all those different pieces together to create something that clearly it's not just something that is solving your own problems right as a landlord, but it's something that it's like your brainchild. And I love that. Um, and, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, before we started, um, I have a bit of a selfish interest in this conversation today because I'm getting ready to list a property that I'm going to manage remotely. So with that in mind, um, I want to ask you a little bit about the type of landlords that you see. Um, I guess I always think of landlords that kind of fall into different categories, but I'm wondering like how you see it from your angle. Yeah. 14,000 properties in the portfolio. So I think it's really wise to nowadays um, consider remote management. But, you know, 10 years ago, I would have said, Jonathan, are you sure you want to do that? Um, the technology was not set up how it is today. Um, when I think about landlords, they basically used to fall into two buckets. It was do it yourself property management, where you were forced to do everything yourself do the rental showings, do all the inspections, call the plumber, call the electrician, collect the rent, post the eviction notices, or hire a full service property manager. And it was only those two. And a full service property manager would essentially take the keys, do everything for you, and send you the rent in the mail. Now there's been this transformation, especially as more folks are looking to invest remotely, as well as folks wanting more transparency into their properties that there's everything in between, which is what I call hybrid property management. So Jonathan, that's what you're doing. Remotely investing your property, but having the boots on the ground, the folks that you need there, like the handyman, the plumber, someone to show your property, or having technology do that. So having folks on the ground, but still being in the decision making seat and being able to do some things yourself. And so that's really the transformation we've seen. If you take a step back and just look at the market today, 72% of rental properties are self-managed. So they're not using a third party to manage their rental properties. And why that fact is so important is we don't actually see that shifting. It's not like more people are going to property managers as technology gets better. If anything, they're like you, Jonathan, where they say, oh, I'll go invest somewhere else and I'll still be able to manage my property myself. And so that is a, a transformation we'll continue to see over time. Gotcha. That makes sense. So with that transformation happening, um, are you also seeing people, especially people that have been in the business a little bit longer, are you seeing them shift their management style where maybe they were only doing everything locally and now more open to remote, uh, but then also where I guess people that are more like me, where they're like 
going straight to just doing remote after the bat? Yeah, so I think COVID has really impacted a lot of folks where they're remote, but they didn't really mean to be remote. So most real estate investors still, even though that trend is changing, live close to their property. And COVID was really this wake up call of, oh, I could move away or I physically shouldn't be there on site at the property. And so it forced folks to do a lot more remotely. And that has been really helping kind of spur this trend towards remote management and considering it as an option where you physically don't have to be there. Now, a lot of rental properties, kind of when you break it down, you can break it into a couple of different categories. There is someone who is an accidental landlord. They got a property passed down. They decided to hold on to a property. They purchased another one, but they didn't actively look to invest in this property for the sheer sake of it being a rental. Um, those types of accidental landlords, um, for the most part, tend to be much more hands-on with their property. And then when you get to the, the remote real estate investor, the Jonathans of the world, um, what you do see with them is they're strategically purchasing a property to optimize their cash flow. And they're looking at that. They're looking at cap rates. They're much more strategic. They're less emotionally attached to the property. And in that particular case, this whole concept of remotely managing and not being there actually becomes even more important because for them, they say, I need to optimize my cash flow. And the only way to do that is through some sort of hybrid model where I know my time's valuable. Let me try to automate myself out of so much of what I'm doing. And I physically shouldn't be driving to the property. If I were doing that, then I'm not really a real estate investor. I'm a landlord. And thinking about alternative ways to make sure that they have folks on site when they need them while still being able to optimize their bottom line and be in, in um, part of that um, decision making um, for any sort of large decision they need um, to make with the property. Cool, that makes sense. Um, I feel that obviously COVID caused a paradigm shift in a lot of industries. I mean, it completely changed the way we work. Um, and obviously changed the way that people manage properties and, and our landlords. What do you think was the biggest challenge that like, oh, snap moment for people when they realized, hey, I can't be doing walkthroughs of my property anymore. Or it's harder to get a plumber out there because you know of uh, restrictions going to people's houses or even curfews and so on. Yeah, so I think so right when COVID started, um, you know, it, it didn't change right then. It wasn't until you started to see that um, eviction um, moratoriums came into place. And then tenants started pushing back saying, I physically don't want you here at the property that folks started changing that mindset um, because of two things. One, with eviction moratoriums, they were having to become more educated and say, I need to take mat matters into my own hands if I want to make sure that I can maintain my cash flow. I need to know what type of tenant I have in the property. Is this eviction moratorium going to affect me? And then from the perspective of you know collecting rent and things like that, they were suddenly realizing snail mail, having checks, all of this other stuff, or even going down and collecting the cash was not as good as having a um, system online where everyone could do things from their computer and never leave their house. Um, those were the two things that really started to change the industry where we saw more and more folks saying, hey, we are looking at um, a more transparent solution to property management of hybrid property management. We're looking to use technology. We're looking for transparency of what's happening in the day to day. Um, we kind of saw two things with full service property management. There were either one fantastic full service property managers who hit it head on, communicated with their tenants and their clients, the landlords, um, really effectively letting them know what was going on with COVID and how it was impacting their property. But then we saw a lot that were kind of behind the times and it actually impacted the real estate investor or the landlord where they said, oh my gosh, I have no control over this property and things aren't going the way I want them to. And then those people started looking at hybrids or alternative solutions to property management. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, before we continue, I just want to remind everyone that there's a Q&A tab on the right side. If you have any questions, please drop them in there. Uh, we'll curate them and go through them probably in about 
10 minutes or so, we'll start answering questions. Uh, but please drop them now so we can uh, start to look at them and incorporate them in the conversation as well. Um, you know, we just talked about a lot of different things. Uh, COVID, moratoriums, property maintenance, um, education of landlords and the tenants. Um, I'm really curious, where are some of the, I guess there's different layers to this. What are some of the challenges that you might run into with tenants when you're in a situation where now the laws have changed essentially, right? Like the moratoriums were a change to the way we did business, right? Um, and then what are some of the challenges that came out of that? And then what are some of the things that you saw landlords and I guess property managers in general do to adjust to that new uh, situation? Yeah. So even today, laws are constantly changing, especially in states like California, where I am, where it feels like a new tenant landlord law is coming out. I think the biggest thing is education. Um, and so understanding like the headline news was completely inaccurate and false about everything. It was saying, you know, eviction moratorium, um, tenants can stay rent free. Well, that was not really the case back then. You still had to have a, um, a justification or reason that COVID has impacted your ability to pay rent in certain things like that. And, you know, now COVID's a thing of the past, but the same thing comes up, Jonathan, for, for today of how do you stay educated to make sure that you understand what's going on in um, uh, what's happening today and how that affects you and your tenants and how your tenants might come forward with it. Um, like much more recent example would be inflation and rent increases. And like, how do you manage something like that when your tenants are like, oh my gosh, you know, we have 9% plus inflation, but our jobs, our wages are only going up 6%. We're not even going to be able to afford rent because of all of this, these discretionary and other items that we're buying, like household goods. Now, if you raise rent, you know, 15% or whatever market rate is in your area, that's going to have a direct impact on me as a tenant. How do you address that kind of stuff up front with your tenants? That makes you a much better real estate investor and much more successful. And so you kind of want to look at every single time, what are the trends? And then think about how do I provide a win-win for both me and the tenants? So that's basically your customer. How do I provide a really good um, solution for them and for me, that's a win-win for everyone. Um, there's always a way to do that within with everything. Um, and so I think that's kind of the fun part about real estate investing is there's always something like that that comes up and you can problem solve and, and come up with the best solution. Amazing. Um, I feel like we've talked a lot about what to do when something changes. I want to take it back a little bit and, and talk about the proactive side. What are some things you can do before something changes? Like, what, what are some things you can do on the lease or in tenant screening? Um, yeah, great, great, that. great question. Um, so I'll talk about that. I'll also talk about lease renewals just because I just brought that up. But then I want to go back to the tenant screening and things like that. Um, for example, inflation is a really hot topic right now. When you do a lease renewal, the worst thing for you to do, and Jonathan, let's just say you're my tenant, um, the worst thing for me to do would be to say, hey, Jonathan, I'm going to increase your rent by 10%. Go ahead and sign this lease. That's a terrible. Jonathan feels terrible about that, right? That, that is not a good feeling. He doesn't feel like I'm on his side. But imagine if I went back to Jonathan and I said, Jonathan, you have been such a fantastic tenant. You've been really responsible with troubleshooting, preventative maintenance, all these different things. You pay your rent on time. I'd love to give you two options to renew your lease. You can either renew it at 5% and I'll lock you into an annual contract, but you have to sign a year or maybe two years with me at a 5% increase. Or Jonathan, if you want to stay month to month, it will be up to like 10%. What would you like to choose? Suddenly 5% increase doesn't sound bad at all because, and even though it's a longer term, which is better for me as a landlord, less turnover, I can control it to be in the summer or whenever the good months are for turning over a property. Suddenly it's kind of a win-win for both of us. And so kind of thinking about and setting up those practices are super important. Now, back, Jonathan, to what you were saying about tenant screening um, and upfront, the most costly expense is a bad tenant. 
And um, Jonathan, have you ever had any bad experiences with tenants with your own rental properties? I'm curious. Um, I haven't. I can tell you my business partner has because okay. of the moratorium, uh, but I won't. That can be a whole hour long conversation. But uh, okay, it's been two years in the making. This uh, this eviction that hasn't happened yet. So. Okay. Okay, gosh, well, that's, um, that is a long time. And um, I, I can only imagine, especially with legal bills where they are, that it's not a good situation to be in, especially if it's two years of an eviction. Um, and uh, so yeah, for tenants, that's the most costly expense is a bad tenant, some tenant being in a property for two years, and not moving out, but also not paying rent. Um, and so I think the most important thing, and it's very similar to um, hiring folks to work with you and build your ideas, you will probably screen a ton of people until you find the right qualified person. And the worst thing to do is to say, my property's on the market. I haven't gotten a renter for it, so I'm just going to take this um, person who came into my pipeline. They're not that qualified, but I'll make some exceptions because I just want to start collecting rent. Um, a bad tenant will cost you way more in the end. Um, you will have um, the, the financial stress of not collecting rent. You will have the emotional stress of staying up at night, wondering what's going to happen next. And um, you yourself will not invest in more properties. And the goal here is obviously for you to build an empire and buy more properties. But if you have a bad experience, you're going to go and put the money into some alternative investment, which is not as good as real estate. And so that screening process is really, really important up front. And Jonathan, I think you're going through this now. Um, the first thing is to make sure on the advertising side that you're advertising to the most rental listing websites. Um, you know, kind of in order of it, the Zillow group typically gets the most inquiries, but not all of them. It's about 70%. Then you get down to Zumper, Realtor.com, Apartments.com. Those tend to have help fill in the rest of the, the 30%. But you always have like an additional, or I sh should say 25%. You always have an additional about 5% of, of listings that come from other sources. So making sure you're advertising and every tenant out there has the opportunity to apply. And then you want to pre-screen your tenants, um, you know, before even showing the property. Great, Jonathan. Thanks for your interest in my property. Do you have a credit score over 600? By the way, you can pull your a free credit report here just to kind of cross check. Jonathan, you know, have you ever had an eviction? Because if you've had an eviction, you don't qualify for my place. So really doing those, that screening up front is super important. The next step is actually doing the application, background and credit check, including income verification, really making sure that at the end of the day, you walk away with a third party opinion saying, yes, you should accept or deny this tenant. And the devil can always be in the details. There may be some things such as their credit score is low but it's low because their child has cancer and they have medical bills to pay or whatever it may be. But really making sure you have that transparency and know exactly what you're getting into will be super important as part of that process. And running running a really strict and rigid process is important. Um, I can give you one example um, on that. There's so many times where someone says, oh, you know, Jonathan and I are applying to a rental property. And Jonathan says, hey, can I just do the background and credit check? Because um, Dana shouldn't have to do it, right? Let's just save money and just Jonathan does it. The landlord might say, oh, yeah, you're right, Jonathan. You have such great credit and such great income. Like, we don't have to run Dana's. You guys will both move into the place. Well, imagine if I'm a murderer and I've killed 20 people slash have five evictions on my record. Suddenly that will change things. And so making sure you stick with that process of, no, we're going to screen everyone, anyone over the age of 18, even if it's a kid of yours, they need to be screened. We need to go through this process. Just having that transparency and knowing what you're getting into will go a really far way. That makes sense. Um... That was a lot. Thank you for that. Um, I have so many questions that came out of that answer. Um, okay. I have a question about, I guess, more so of your personal experience or your personal view on things, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, what do you feel is more relevant? The credit score? So assume that income is more than your minimum requirement. That you, okay. If I meet your income requirement, um, what's going to have more weight to accept a tenant? A credit score or eviction record? Eviction record, 100%. Um, 
the reason is if something's on your uh, eviction record, that not only means that they brought the tenant to court, but the tenant lost. And a lot of evictions I know don't actually get brought to court. So there's no record of it. Let's just say I'm your tenant, Jonathan. I'm not paying rent. Okay. Well, Jonathan, you come to me and say, Dana, where's your money? Right? Like, well, obviously you wouldn't say that, but like, hey, you owe me rent and you haven't. If I tell you, hey, Jonathan, by the way, like I can't pay rent. I just lost my job. Uh, my mom passed away, whatever has happened. But I understand, like, I'm so sorry. I'm going to move out because I haven't been able to pay you rent. And I just move out. That is never on the record ever, right? And so there's situations like that where, like, that tenant wouldn't have an eviction record. And maybe would you take them on because they went through a hard time? Yeah, sure. But the ones that actually have something on their eviction record are, that's a serious problem. They think that they're in the right to live there rent free and are not paying the landlord and make the landlord go through a costly and lengthy entire eviction process to get that on their record. So that is like super serious to me of like, hey, not only can this person not manage their bills or maybe, you know, their credit score um, is high that they can manage their bills, but they think they are too good to pay me my rent, which was a legally binding contract that we agreed to. Um, so any day I would take um, a lower credit score or no credit. There are some people who pay everything with cash. Um, I would take that over having eviction on the record. Gotcha. Yeah, it's actually similar to what uh, my friend, the business partner, is going through now. Um, basically, tenants decided to stop paying rent. And they've done damage to the property. She's had to do like pest control and repairs, and they haven't paid rent in two years. And the yeah. courts have a role on this, so it's a challenge uh, for sure. Um, we're getting some questions in, and I think this one kind of aligns with the topic we have at hand. It's a bit of a loaded question. I don't know if okay. you can see them. Um, so I'm going to read it out. And let me know if this even falls into something that uh, you've dealt with before. Um, it's about group homes. So it says, what are the best ways to manage a group home where there is a group of tenants renting individual rooms in a common home? So it's, I guess, more of like a people renting rooms in a home. Uh, does it make sense to manage individual leases or one common lease? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. That actually comes up so much room for rent right now because you can make more money off of it. So if I have my preference, I'm going to have one lease that makes them jointly responsible. In other words, Jonathan, I'm not your mom. I'm not your father. I am have a, a legally binding contract that all of you guys need to figure things out. I don't care who put the hole in the wall, who broke the garbage disposal, you guys are jointly responsible to figure that out. I'm not your parent. I'm not going to, you know, manage this relationship, especially because I don't live there. So I don't see what happens behind closed doors. You guys are jointly responsible. Here's one lease. You all sign it. Jonathan stops paying his rent because he says that Cassie is being mean to him and throws too many parties. Will you guys figure that out? You guys all owe me rent. I will evict all of you if you guys don't pay. Joint leases will save you so much headache. However, there's situations, especially if you have a larger home, like a five bedroom, where the tenants don't all know each other and they don't want to be jointly responsible. That makes it very difficult. You can make more money off of the top line, but you're going to have a lot more turnover. So vacancy costs, right? When Because the tenants fight, they don't know each other. You're also going to have situations like um, uh, tenants saying, oh, well, I'm moving out and that stain on the carpet, that wasn't me. That was the other tenant. So in the communal area, you can't deduct that from my rent. That's communal area. Um, and then on top of that, anything that happens to the communal area, because they're individual leases, that's like basically the landlord's responsibility to replace and, and make the communal area um um, keep it up to the, the standards it should be at. Um, so I would take one lease any day over having multiple leases. If you do multiple leases, they there are um, programs out there like Homeroom 
it's livehomeroom.com or something like that. Those types of programs will help you manage multiple leases um, and, and, and help do the full property management. You could also use Hemlane and manage each one individually. But as a landlord, it's going to be a lot more for you, a lot more work, time and effort to actually do the management on it. Because again, you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. It's where people live, they become emotional. And suddenly it's a he said, she said, and you're in the middle of it. And all you want is passive cash flow. And suddenly you're not getting that. I love that you mentioned that at the top line, you'll see more money. Uh, if you do like the room by the room type rentals, I actually looked at a deal like that with a couple of my friends and uh, we're looking to buy a house and rent it by the room. The numbers were insanely high. I mean, it, looked, yeah. it looked so profitable until we spoke to a few people that were doing that and realized how expensive it gets and how you end up losing a lot more in cost than what you would in like a long-term rental with just one lease. Yeah, it, exactly. And you'll get situations like especially nowadays um, with like, I mean, COVID's, COVID's kind of over, over a thing of a, the past, but one tenant says another one gave me COVID and you have all of this kind of liability of people living together and using communal space together. It just gets a lot, a lot more difficult. And if you ever wanted to sell the property or you wanted um, to change, change it up, now suddenly you're having to deal with five or four leases and trying to get them all out. Um, and then I've seen situations where the landlord says like, oh, we have a new tenant coming in. They've qualified for the property. And the tenants living there say, we don't want this person to live here. We're going to give them a terrible time so that they move out because we're buddy buddy. And like, we don't want this new person coming in. And then suddenly it becomes subjective. They become part of that process to qualify tenants which is kind of illegal and a fair housing violation. So you have a lot of that go on. Yeah, so it's like a headache. We're definitely going to stay away from that. Yeah. Um, we got a few more questions coming in. Uh, let's see if we can grab this one. Uh, if you're okay with this one, this one says, can you comment on areas, like state, county, et cetera, that are more advantageous to landlords than others? Oh, yeah. So where you are, Jonathan, Florida, is much more tenant friendly. Um, same with Texas. Um, it, basically, there's actually a map. Um, we have it on um, uh, hemling.com forward slash resources that shows tenant sta friendly states versus landlord friendly states. Actually, you could also just Google it tenant versus landlord friendly states and get an image to see the states that are very, very tenant friendly are California, um, Washington, to some extent, New York, um, uh, Illinois, so she, because especially because of Chicago, you'll see in some of those areas where it's incredibly tenant friendly. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't mean it's a terrible place to invest, but you just have to really make sure you understand tenant landlord law. For example, in California, they actually restrict how much you can increase rent. So we have rent control where there's caps of how, how much you can increase it. And so certain things like that just make it a little bit more difficult to do the management. We also find in those states that are tenant friendly, eviction processes take a lot longer and are much more costly. Of course, you can mitigate it by doing everything up front so you never have an eviction, but we definitely see that. And so if you could go anywhere, um, definitely look at the, the tenant or the landlord friendly states first. I would definitely add Massachusetts. Uh, definitely the Boston area to the tenant friendly uh, states and areas. Um, I want to talk a little bit about pricing. And I think this goes really well with the whole um, cap on rental increases. Yeah. What are some things that you can do? Hmm. It's a two part question. So, first one is going to be about setting the pricing for the property up front. The follow up to that, so you know what's coming next, it's going to be around making sure you're still able to increase the rent when the renewal comes up uh, as close to market as you can. So let's go with the first part, which is how do you figure out what the right pricing is? And again, trying to attract that right tenant that's not going to give you, you know, silly issues, uh, being able to not have a long vacancy. How do you come up with the right pricing strategy? Uh, is it just something, it doesn't vary by market. Yeah, I love working with real estate investors because they're very non-emotional where they just look at the numbers and say, this is what the rent should be. 
oftentimes if you're an accidental landlord where it was like the home you grew up in or um, a, a home that um, you acquired through like a trust or something, um, they become a lot more a lot, um, a lot more unreasonable when it comes to like what they think the rent is. They're like, oh, well, this home has gr granite countertops and the other comparable property doesn't. So I can increase the rent by $500 a month. No, you can't. A tenant is not going to care as much about those granite countertops as much as you do. And so I really do find that um, working with real estate investors, if you've done your pro forma up front before purchasing the property, you already know what rental comps are in the area. Don't try to do this. Oh, here was the rent last year and inflation is up by this amount. So I'm going to put the rent at, you know, last last year's rate plus one plus or times one plus inflation. No, 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 no. All you care about is putting yourself in the tenant's shoes. A tenant goes on to Craigslist, Zillow, Zumper, Apartments.com. They search your area. They type in two bedroom, at least one bathroom or two bathrooms, and they look at everything that's there. And so what you have to do is just go on there and say, what are the other properties in the market going for? And how does mine stack up to that? Is my rental rate going to be competitive? Because the worst thing to do is put it on the market too high. Five days go by, you have no tenant leads, your property listing has dropped to the bottom of the listing websites, you start cutting the price down, tenants see that as like fear, like, oh, they're a price cut, maybe I could cut it some more. And you always lose more in the end. So do that research, see what else is in the market and don't get too greedy on it. It's better to, you know, drop it by $100 a month or something to get that lease signed versus keeping it on the market for two months and losing $4,000 in monthly rent for that year because you were too greedy with an extra $100 or $200. Now it makes perfect sense. Now this is actually my question because something I'm considering doing. Yeah. Um, I got this from a friend. Um, so the idea is that when you're in a market where you have rent control, so you're capped at a 5% increase year over year, but the actual market is going up, let's say 10, 15%. Right? Yep. Right. Um, this is what I was suggested that I could do. Just curious if you've seen other people do this and if you like vouch for it. What you can do is let's say you can price your property at $5,000 a month. You price it at $6,000. Then you give the renter a credit for $1,000 a month for the duration of the first year. Of the first year? Yeah, I think there's there's um, two things there. One, it, it, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't provide legal advice. But in most cases, in most states, I've seen that that you can definitely do. Um, I always try to be transparent with um, tenants and say like, hey, you get that first year discount. But in the future, you know, that could go away just to make sure they know what they're they're getting set up for. However, um, just it, 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 it could be a little bit shady to the tenants and also how you set it up because you're not going to want to put it on market right now for $6,000 a month. If you know it's truly market value for year one is at $5,000 and you're expecting it to go to $6,000. So you're going to want to put it on market for $5,000 so you get more demand because if you do $6,000, tenants are going to say it's too expensive. Then let's just say, Jonathan, you come to me as your, my tenant and you're the one who's qualified. And I say, Jonathan, I know I listed it at $5,000 a month, but I'm actually going to put your lease for $6,000 and then give you a $1,000 credit. A tenant might be like, wait, what's what's going on here? You know, the dynamics. So it might be more confusing um, than it's worth. However, if you have a lot of popular demand and you say, hey, this is what I'm doing, Jonathan, do you accept it? Then you would be the tenant to move forward. You're the first qualified. Then yeah, may maybe you can definitely do that. I have seen that type of thing, especially with adding on like the pet rent and stuff like that and considering it rent um, and then being able to alter things that way. Um, so I've definitely seen that happen. Um, I always just like to be really transparent with the, the tenants to, to kind of let them know why, yeah. Gotcha. And no, I'm, I'm really happy with the angle you took on that because that was uh, the conversation I had. Um, yeah. How do you how do you present this? Is this it, how does this sound? And is that really is it the right thing? Is it the right thing to do? And does it even sound right to do it? Uh, but it was an interesting approach to not really get around the rent the um, rent control, but more so be able to adapt to it uh, over time. Yeah.
Um, yeah, with idea I, being, you know, you're able to keep the tenant longer, right? That's the idea. Yeah. You want to keep them longer. And I do have to say that is one thing, like the tenant is your customer. You do want, I've noticed if you have a great relationship with them, it's going to be something where they give back. They like help you out on things if you're helping them. And so a lot of times you just really want to start off the relationship on a really positive note um, and not kind of try anything shady that they may be like, oh, I got screwed over. This landlord is is such a slumlord type thing. And, and not to say that this landlord is, they're probably, they're probably fantastic. But I try to be really transparent and honest with them. And that always at the end of the day helps because you know, then you just continue to keep the same tenant in, which is much better than losing $5,000 due to vacancy because I had to turn over the unit because the tenant didn't like me. No, absolutely, 100%. Uh, we got a few more questions coming in. Let me uh, publish all of these and we'll go through them. Um, we only have about five, five, let's say 10 minutes left. So let's see if we can get through these. Great. Um, all right, so from Sammy Hill, uh, you mentioned a smart home technology to detect issues early. What are some examples of those uh, smart home technologies you can use? Yeah, so there's a lot in the commercial space, um, especially like smart rent has um, smart rent has it um, to be able to de to detect those. There's also just things if you go to Home Depot, there's a section where you can put things like um, uh, sensors on, on certain areas. Like there's actually like literally a whole section in Home Depot and Lowe's, and you can get this stuff, and it's like very cost effective and just put it in different areas for like what sensing if there's water or sensing um obviously if there um if your water heater is going to go out there's things that you can post on it so there's a ton of different brands that do it and you can just get those types of sensors to do it as far as like a home technology system that's like an app to do it all um there's not quite something there that's like affordable for rent rentals at this moment but except for like um, smart rent, but it will eventually get there. Like it eventually transpires down to rentals. So in like three to four years, we'll be there with that. Um, just to pick it back on that, what are there any concerns with privacy with some of those smart devices? There, so that's a good question. I think with privacy, privacy is a huge thing, especially with tenants. Like if you have cameras outside the house, if you have um, like ring doorbell is another one or like a nest um, doorbell, either one where um, a tenant would be like, wait, do you have access to this? I think it's really important when you start a relationship with them is for them to understand what is in the household who has access to it and why that is there and how this is not an invasion of their privacy. And then you you need to put it into the lease agreement that by agreeing to live here, you agree to have these sensors in the home. It's for your own um, personal protection, et cetera. Um, you, you really do have to worry about privacy. Everything from that of like smart home technology, all the way to um, also like if you do an inspection, you can't be taking photos, uh, like inspection photos of like pictures of their kids and things like that. You have to be really cautious about what you do. And so I think it's always good to at the onset say like, yes, it does come with a ring doorbell just as a heads up. Here's how the privacy works with it, whatever it may be to make sure that they understand what they're getting into. They're comfortable with it before they sign the lease, because that will set it off on a, a really good note, a really good foot. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have three more questions. Um, okay. I'd like to see if we can get through the next few minutes. Um, all right. So this one is about, um, I guess it's when you see places like Roofstock, it says Rootstock, I'm assuming it's Roofstock. Um, would you recommend getting a property with tenants already in place? Uh, and I guess that could also apply to like Dorbes and Awning as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So um, with all of them, I, it's not a bad thing to get a property with tenants in place. In most of those cases, so in Awning's case, Roofstock and um, Dorvest, all three of those will qualify the tenants and provide you with the existing lease, provide you with the application, provide you with the credit score. At least every experience I've had working with those companies, they have done that. Um, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, what I would check with is just confirm, hey, the tenants are required to like pay rent for the next three months or you give me some sort of eviction service or something like that to make sure that you mitigate that risk. But in the most case, cases with tenants that are um, occupying the property, 
I found it to be quite successful um, to manage those properties. We actually help manage their properties and like every single case I can think of with Roofstock, it's been pretty positive, the tenant transition. They've been very open to it, um, uh, grateful with it. And like the most important thing is to say, listen, the property was sold, but I'm not gonna be changing any terms on your lease. Uh, it's gonna be the same for now. It's just new ownership and management. Um, if you set it up that way, the tenants will be um, very open to like making sure they follow the terms of the lease and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think tenant occupied is necessarily a, a bad thing in any case. Cool, awesome. And shameless plug, Beeline does have agreements with those three companies. So check out the deals we have with them because you get- Oh, awesome. Um, all right, next one. If someone wants to check out the platform, uh, definitely Hamlin has a free trial. So definitely go check that out. Um, evictions for breach of lease. Um, I'm not sure I'm following the question. Let me leave that one last. Um, sorry, Dr. Valley. Should I include HOA in the rent? HOA covers water, trash, and sewer, and is subject to change once in a while. Or should I collect base rent and ask for HOA to be, to be paid September in full for a portion? It is very rare for a landlord to take HOA fees and put those on top of the rent. Usually you've already baked it into your rent. You basically say, because tenants don't want to feel nickel and dimes. Like if you say my rental rate is $2,000 a month and then suddenly you're like, oh, but there's another $400 for um, HOA and another, you know, $300 for utilities and all these things, suddenly it becomes unaffordable and we were qualifying them on their um, uh, 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 income to rent ratio. You want to just bake the HOA fee into there. So you don't put the HOA fee on tenants. Now, utilities and things like that, you would just have them pay those directly if you can, assuming everything's submetered. Um, and you would just bake into the rent, you know, HOA fees are $300. So my rental price um, should be comparable to others on market. And assuming all of those include their HOA fees and they have similar amenities. Yeah, I have a very... Um opinionated position on HOAs. The only place where I think HOAs even make sense is in a place like Orlando, where you have an Airbnb, like a short-term rental property. So you don't have to worry about anything and then you don't worry about it. But yeah, I and, and, HOAs, like and, and jo Jonathan, I couldn't agree more with you. I think most real estate investors try to avoid HOAs because again, you don't have that control. Like I've seen HOAs increase costs like 50% year over year. And so then you're forced to put that into your rent increase for tenants. And it's something you can't really control. I've also seen HOAs run really inefficiently and ineffectively. Um, and like, it's like, what is all this money going to? We're paying you quite a bit. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely do agree with you that if you can avoid an HOA, um, it, it, it's probably better. Um, of course, not in all cases, your strategy might be different, um, but there's a lot of real estate investors opposed to it. For sure. All right, last question, I promise. Um, right, uh, from Danny, I've had many experiences with repair uh, maintenance costs varying from contractor to contractor. Any advice on preventing being overcharged and minimizing repair expenses? Oh my gosh, I love this one. Um, we have a shortage of contractors. I think that um, we definitely need vocational trades out there to teach more people to be contractors. Being a contractor is really tough. Um, if you look at none of them are like rolling up in Range Rovers to, to do the repairs, but it always seems like someone is nickel and diming you and charging you way too much. Try to get it set up. Like what you don't want to do is send someone out there and find out the bill is $700 when it should only be $100. And then it's awkward with your tenant because the tenant's like, the handyman is here to fix it. And you're like, sorry, declined. You're going to have to wait three days for this to be fixed. I need to get someone else out. And your tenant's like, are you kidding me? You're such a slumlord. Um, you know, it, it leads to a really bad relationship with your tenants. So what I do is I ask initial questions right up front on the phone or via text. I say, I'm going to bring you repeat business. I only want to use you, assuming this all works out. I'm going to be 100% loyal to you. But like, I just want to confirm on a couple of things, you know, 
one, a license, insurance, bonded, whatever um, you have as qualifications there, like a handyman won't be um, uh, licensed, but they should have some sort of insurance, right? Making sure you mitigate that risk. Then the next thing to ask them are certain things like how much would it cost to do this job? Like a plumber is the easiest one. How much would it cost if you were to replace a garbage disposal? Now, you know that like most times handymen could do that, but figuring out like what would be their cost? Okay, does that include parts? Do you mark up on parts? If you can ask a couple of different examples and they say it's gonna be $450 to replace a garbage disposal right off the bat, then you know like this person's too expensive. But you can ask that and be like, hey, my garbage disposal needs to be replaced. How much would that cost? Something that is like so standard and see how they respond to it. You might not even need that done. You're just trying to build up your vendor list, but you can use that to understand, are they going to price gouge me or not? And then it's really important to know, like, do you do, do you go out free or is there a service call? Most have service calls. In one quick tip, I found that vendors who don't have service call rates charge you so much when it's actually time to do the service. So they say, Jonathan, I'll go out for free to your property. And then they're out there and they're like, it's $450 to fix this. Hoping that you're going to say yes. And that's how they make up for these the service calls. I've actually found, and this is just through our data, those that have service calls where they're like, it's 60, $67 and that can be applied towards the work being done. I found those people, the overall cost tends to be less. Um, so kind of ask those specific questions of certain situations of, hey, you've driven out. What's the full cost, both from a service call rate as well as the work being done? And then um, you can figure it out there. Again, it's going to be trial and error working with the people. Like you need to get them on site. You need to see and you'll build up trust over time. You won't have that trust until you physically have them out there a couple of times. When you find a good person, keep them. Um, you'll also find sometimes you need to change them out. They get too busy or um, I've seen ones where they like, you know, suddenly uh, become an alcoholic and don't show up the next day and you need to change them out. So you want to constantly stay on your toes and you want to be really professional about it throughout the whole process. You don't want to waste their time though. You have to understand these people are really busy, have low margins. They're like driving all around the city trying to get work done. Um, and so you really want to make sure you're really professional with like what questions you ask initially and then testing them out, getting that business, seeing the quality of the business as well as the cost. Um, you usually don't want to use the cheapest contractor. They usually cost you more in the end, I found. They do things incorrectly. Um, and so there's always that balance there. There's no perfect answer. And I think, um, you know, that's part of kind of the fun of building up your network and building up your team um, is that it happens over time. For sure. Um, I would just add also, if you're remote, you can go on like the bigger pockets, Facebook group. And I recently discovered Reddit. It's a great place to get referrals for service providers that are not in your area. So definitely check that out. I didn't know that about Reddit, Jonathan. That's fantastic. That's my new discovery. I've been avoiding Reddit for years. I just never got into it. And yeah. um, I just did a Google search. I forget what I was looking for. And it took me to a, a Reddit group. Okay. And I'm hooked. <laughs> so I'm all the real estate investing and like homeownership, landlord and DIY groups now. So. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Great. All right. We're a little over the time that I said we would take today. So I want to be respectful of your time. I did want to offer you like 30 to 60 seconds to pitch him lane full on, uh, tell us everything about it. And, uh, and then we'll close out. Fantastic. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so for those of you who are listening to this, um, Hemlane is everything between DIY and full service property management. We have flexible packages um, with a free trial. So you can go on to Hemlane, H-E-M-L-A-N-E.com and pick what's right for you. We have everything from software to automate yourself out of the day to day to um, offering add on services and packages that take you out of the day to day. We have things such as 24 seven repair coordination. We do all the troubleshooting. We close out 7% of the requests before a service professional has to even be involved in it. Um, we help pay the service professionals on your behalf. We let you take a back seat. 
We also have things such as delinquency services. If a tenant's late, we'll serve the notices on your behalf for your specific region. Um, so there's a lot of fun things that you can do with um, Hemlane. Everything from um, just kind of automating yourself out of the day to day to being much more hands off and going to Bali on vacation and taking a back seat for however long you you want. Awesome, thank you. Like I said, I'm I'm doing the trial right now, and so far I like it. Awesome. I'll be using it. Um, just real quick before we close, I know we didn't get to all the questions. I will follow up with I think I only missed two. Uh, one of them was legal advice, so. I'm sorry, I couldn't really get into legal advice territory, uh, but I think we can answer the other one via email. If you have any other questions that you didn't get a chance to type in or you were too shy to ask, you can send them to, you can go to go.makeabeeline.com slash question and submit it there. Also, if you're looking for financing for a deal, you can also go there. We'll put you in contact with a loan guide. In two weeks, September 21st, uh, actually it's two weeks in a day, September 21st, we have the last session of this real estate investing bootcamp. And it's gonna be all about tax planning with the CPA dude. And I am super excited for that one because I mean, I don't know about everybody else on, on this uh, call right now. We had like 40 something people at one point. Um, I tried to minimize my taxes. So we'll be talking all about minimizing taxes as a real estate investor. So please be there. Dana, thank you so much. I feel like we could have talked for like six hours about property management. I hope we get to spend a little more time together some other time. Uh, for now, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, hope to chat soon. Great. Likewise. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you.